This is the fourth video in our Finding the Best Dividend ETF series. Today we're going to look at SCHD versus VYM, and we've also thrown in HDV. So basically we're taking Schwab's popular dividend ETF, SCHD, and comparing that to two high-yield, low-fee alternatives. Now in our last video on Noble, the Dividend Aristocrats ETF, we concluded that based on research from academics and industry, uh, and everything in between, transaction fees, so expense ratios, are the most consistent and accurate predictor of an ETF's performance. We love it when there's broad rules like that because it, they make it very easy to uh, objectively make investment decisions with conviction. So consequently, any ETF that has uh, an expense ratio over 10 basis points isn't going to be considered. So that uh, reduces our universe down to a handful of dividend ETFs. Now, dividend growth is a critically important factor for us, and here's why. So what we've done here is put together a spreadsheet that shows four different yields across the top there. So you see yield at 3 4 5 and 6%. Each of these yields is growing at a different growth rate. So the lowest yield of 3% is growing at 8%. And that's pretty typical for a um, dividend growth strategy such as the one that we run here at Nanolyze, uh, sustained over time. Then you can see how growth tails off to the right. So the 4% yield is growing at 5%, 5% yield growing at 3%, etc. Then we've highlighted how long it takes the highest growing yield to catch up with the other one. So you can see that uh, by year 11, that 3% yield has already caught up to the 4 and 5% yield. So it's now at 7%. And then you can see also in year 13 that it catches the 2% growth of the 6% yield. So the takeaway here is that if you're investing in dividend ETFs and your horizon is measured in decades, then you're um, well served to pay attention to growth over yield. Now, we put this together in another piece we did called Living Off Dividends. I'll link to it in the description of this video. Uh, this is a drip spreadsheet that shows dividend growth. So this is an individual saving uh, $1,600 roughly per month. That should be fairly feasible for anybody that has a decent job and lives below their means, a portfolio yield of 3.2% and dividend growing at 8%. Well, these are realistic numbers to achieve with a dividend portfolio. And what you end up with uh, after 15 years, so that's not very long. If you're 30 years old, you start doing this, you're going to be 45 and you have a portfolio of $500,000 worth of stocks, all right? And that's not even considering appreciation, all right? We're just taking the um, value that you've put in and aggregating that based on the um, reinvestment of dividends and the growth of the dividend over time. So this doesn't even take into account capital appreciation. You have a $500,000 portfolio with $1,337 a month income. Man, in a, a fair number of countries around the world, that's enough to retire with. So a very effective strategy. And we could attest to that with our own quantigen strategy that this works extremely well when you uh, throw a lot of time behind it. So some key points. The problem with fixed income, you know, bonds, what financial advisors talk about, you know, weighting your portfolio with bonds and equities, and as you age, uh, increasing your weighting to fixed income, problem is that fixed income is fixed. So if you're paid a fixed amount every month in 30 years, your purchasing power halves. Who wants their quality of life to decrease as time goes on? That's why we developed Quantigence, because we needed an investment strategy that made the quality of life appreciate as time goes on and beat inflation. So if your time horizon is measured in decades, focus on higher growth income streams. Uh, the goal is not to touch your capital. You just want the income it produces to grow every year. But if you're retired and perhaps you're doing a lump sum investment, you want to maximize income now, then you can go with a higher yield and lower growth. But only if it's safe. This is very important. High yields are not always good. I think when it comes to dividend investing, this is probably the most common mistake that I see investors make is that 
The yield number for a stock means absolutely nothing unless there's some consistency backing it. And I think the example here um, spells it out. Random dividend amounts produce random yield numbers that mean nothing. They only reflect the last payment. So that consistency is what puts some meaning behind a yield number. It's also why we exclude special dividends or one-time dividends from the yield conversation because they're not predictable, right? They're uh, one-off occurrences. Now, when we see high yields start to emerge in our own portfolio, we become quite concerned. And I think a good example of that would be VFC. And you can see that chart on the right. That plots their yield over time. And you can see that spike, that recent spike. Well, um, we did a video on that. It's actually, uh, the link is in the description of this video. And in that case, Moody's ratings were the canary in the coal mine. So uh, they noticed that the company was running, running into problems. And we posed the question, does this represent a buying opportunity or potential danger? We ended up not buying. And when they cut their dividend, we kicked them out um, as quick as you could imagine. Another example would be Exxon. So uh, their yield spiked to over 8% on oil prices. And we actually use that opportunity to add because um, they're subject to volatile commodity prices. I think they've increased their dividend for 47 years in a row. Uh, AT&T, we sold them immediately when their dividend growth stopped. And our current concern would be uh, uh, Walgreen Boots with their 7.6% yield. That's a, a big concern. We need to dig into that actually in a video. But what number should you start worrying at? Well, Track records tell you when things get out of whack, and I've put the J&J &J, uh, yield uh, chart here on the right that shows you um, sort of the ceiling, right? So if you see their yield break that ceiling, then you might want to take a look and see why that's the case. Here I've put up a couple charts. One shows Exxon's spike above 8%. Uh, Exxon has... Um, Oh, it's a 40-year history of increasing annual dividends. It's Walgreens that has a 47-year history, but uh, uh, we're inclined to believe. And you can see here, this is uh, the um, nine-year history of their yield plotted out to 2019. See how it's under 4%? Well, that spike to 7% is extremely concerning. So just to summarize, high yields aren't always good. Consistently growing dividends provides some meaning to that yield number because random dividends are meaningless. Dividend growth has a large impact on returns over time. So let's get back to looking at the best dividend ETF. So these are the three pieces we've done already. We concluded that SCHD, so Schwab's dividend ETF that has, I think it's this, what, second largest dividend ETF, exhibits impressive dividend growth and good yield. VIG, the largest dividend ETF, their methodology is underwhelming and so is their yield. And then Noble, the most recent video we did, their methodology is great. We love aristocrats, but the fees are oppressive. So here's where we're at. Um, VIG then has been crossed out. So Schwab, there is actually in third place by AUM. Then you have two other ETFs, VYM and HDV. So Vanguard's high dividend yield ETF and iShares high, uh, core high dividend ETF. Those are what we're going to look at today. So the next video in this series is going to be the iShares core dividend growth ETF. So make sure you subscribe so you don't miss that video. So let's look at these two high dividend yield ETFs. What do we do when we're looking at an ETF? We always look for the underlying index and that's what we, uh, that's what we examine so we can see the mechanics of the portfolio. For Vanguard, you have the FTSE High Dividend Yield Index, and there's the industry ratings there. You can see it's heavily um, weightings, heavily weighted to financials at 20%. Then you have staples and industrials. Those are traditionally where you find more dividend aristocrats. It has 450 stocks. Contrast that to the iShares High Dividend ETF, which utilizes the Morningstar Dividend Yield Focus Index. Look at their industry weightings, energy at tw close to 21%, healthcare close to 20%, consumer staples at 14%, but they have only 75 stocks. Very surprised to see the dramatic difference between these two ETFs. So when we dig into the FTSE high dividend yield ETF, this is actually FTSE all world, all right? So um, I'm going to provide a little bit of background here. So FTSE has essentially looked across the entire world, developed in emerging markets, and taken all the investable equities out there and aggregated them into a, a universe called FTSE all world. Then what they've done, done is extracted from that uh, a high yield set, all right? And, and the ETF that we're talking about, of course, is only the USA, but that's been carved out of this set. And the reason that 
I'm using the FTSE All World here is because I couldn't find out of the 1,470 fact sheets they have one that was specific to the USA uh, high yield dividend uh, index. So what they've simply done is produce this one and then they do carve outs, right? So uh, this is actually not all caps. So it's just large and large and mid. So that's similar to what MSCI does, what they call standard. But all you could see here is the dividend yield over time and how that uh, is higher than the uh, the larger universe. And that spike there, that would be the Rona, right? So when the, the prices of assets dipped, when the price of an asset dips, the yield increases naturally, right? So that's what happened there. Now, when we look at this index, you have FTSE All World, 4,293 companies. Then All World High Dividend Yield is 1,991 companies. But of course, they're carving out USA, which is a smaller set. Uh, methodology is very straightforward. They remove all REITs. They remove companies that haven't paid a dividend or aren't forecasted to pay a dividend or that don't have any available forecasted dividend information. Uh, distributions deemed as special or excluded, similar to what we do. Remaining stocks ranked from highest to lowest by 12-month forward dividend yield. Then half of that universe is the FTSE All World High Dividend Yield. And then of that, 61% is USA, roughly. And then they carve that out, and that becomes the portfolio that's used by the Vanguard ETF. Now let's talk about the Morningstar Index. And this is a different animal. So Morningstar's reflects the top 97% of the investable U.S. equity market. That's where they start. So that's their starting universe, right? And that presumes then that they're probably including small caps, then they say you must have a qualified dividend paid in the past 12 months. They exclude REITs as well. But here's where things start to get a little more complicated. So then they start applying these proprietary uh, classifications, Morningstar Economic Moat, Morningstar Uncertainty Rating, Distance to Default. And once they've applied all that, they select 75 stocks and they use a dividend dollar weighting so that simply the higher dividends get classified with a, a larger weighting. They use a 5, 10, 50 capping, going back to my index days at MSCI. I think that means that um, the top 10 constituents can't account for more than half of the total portfolio. Right now, they're at 51%, so that means it rebalance. They bring those down probably to 5% across the board there. That, 5, 10, 50, I believe that's what that means. So we understand these methodologies, Morning stars a lot less because of those proprietary signals they're using. So let's look at growth. Remember, we said dividend growth is very important. Uh, notice for VYM here, growth is less volatile. So Vanguard's uh, larger number of companies seem to be uh, helping reduce the uh, increased volatility. All you're seeing in this chart is that payment that you're getting from this ETF. How much does it increase every year? So in year two, it increased 9%. Year three, 13%. You're saying, wow, that's a pretty big increase, right? Think about your raise at work. Then in year uh, four, an increase of 3%. All right, inflation. But you see that um, it's less volatile than the iShares uh, ETF HDV, which actually has some down months. Now, we don't like down months. So in year four, you would have been stoked about 17% increase in your payments there. But then year five, you're down 6%. Oh, why is that? You can see more recently, it's down 2%. But the aggregate, the compound annual growth rate of these payments, higher for VYM, 6.4% against HDV at 5.3%. So VYM versus HDV, let's start there. VYM's methodology is rudimentary and understandable. In other words, you could probably uh, replicate it with enough time and data. Uh, HDV has a fair amount of Morningstar proprietary complexity that we didn't dig into, so we don't fully understand um, how they're selecting those 75 stocks. VYM has less volatile growth, less concentration of portfolio names. They enjoy about 110 basis points more growth. Of course, time's going to tell. We only measured a decade there. But uh, VYM also has two basis points lower fees, going back to our point about transaction fees being a predictor of success. So in our opinion, VYM beats HDV. Okay, VYM versus SCHD. This goes right down to our conversation about dividend growth. So SCHD actually starts out with a higher yield. That's not good when the whole purpose of VYM should be their high yield. So they're actually uh, starting a behind in that race. But then when you look at dividend growth, 
since SCHD paid their last coupon for 2023, we actually have the last 10 years and they're at 9.8%. I don't think their growth this year for their dividend payments was that big, but you can see how this grows over time. So at uh, year 20 there, the SCHD yield on costs would be around 23.5% versus VYM at 10.9%. Year 30, you're at a yield on costs of close to 60% for SCHD, VYM at just 20%. So that's uh, quite telling. We'd say that SCHD is probably the better choice for investors with long-term horizons when it comes to picking the best dividend ETF. Now, another option, and that's what we do here at Analyze, is you can build your own dividend portfolio, choosing from only the best names out there. So we built this strategy, Quantigens. I developed this uh, after a decade of working in the industry and plenty of time in the academic world, uh, along with some esteemed colleagues. Uh, it took us a long time, but we put this together. We just um, are wrapping up an academic paper on this, and we'll be releasing some, some of that data soon in the form of videos. Now, uh, we use seven factors to calculate what's called a Q score. We look at years dividend increase. There's no cap there, so we really reward that track record. International sales size, five and 10-year dividend growth, yield, and payout ratio. So we take all those things into account. The end result is the scores that you see here. So I've now we built this calculator, and we're filtering there on materials, and you can see the Q scores along the right. They're ranked by Q score at the top. There's APD, and you can see the contributors to that Q score. This is something that we're going to be developing over time for our premium subscribers. So uh, I've put up another video here that's quite good on um, living off of dividends. So give that a watch. Make sure to subscribe to this channel. Thanks so much for taking the time to watch this today.